welcome to another episode of Just Podding Around. I'm your host, Reese Williams, and today we'll be looking back at the AEW All Out pay per view from this past weekend. Now, at the show, there were uh, 12 matches all up, with four being on the pre show. And this match, this whole pay per view, was. Fairly well received until the last two matches, which got well, not so much the world championship match, but what happened after the championship match, plus some of the stuff that was in the the in the main event, which was the steel cage match between uh, Swerve Strickland and Hangman Page. Now, before we get into those two, though, I'll just run down and talk about the matches before that. So, let's go. Uh, the first match in the pre-show was uh, just a throwaway tag team match between the Acclaimed with uh, Daddy Ass Billy Gunn defeating the Iron Savages, which is Bron- Bronson and Boulder with Jack Jamison. Yeah, again, this was just a throwaway match, nothing special. Uh, yeah, as I said, the, the acclaimed one. This match was just there uh, to give the acclaimed something to do for the show. Next up, we see Hologram, Sammy Guevara, and Dustin Rhodes. Sammy and Dustin are the current ROH World Tag Team Champions, with Dustin also being one third of the ROH Trios Champions. Uh, taking on. Tony Nace, Ari Davari, and Josh Woods with Smart Mark Sterling. A hologram, uh, Sammy Guevara and Dustin Rhodes end up winning this match. It was nothing special. I th- this was more to push the teaming of Dustin and Sammy and to highlight hologram more. So, yeah, nothing too special here. Next up was a Bang Bang Gang taking on the Dark Order. Uh, it's, I, I find it a bit sad that the Bang Bang Gang, who are former Trios champions, uh, have been relegated to the pre-show. Same with the Dark Order, really. It's a shame that they've been relegated to the pre-show uh, status. But Bang Bang Gang won. Again, yeah, just a throwaway match. Uh, next up, we see the Undisputed Kingdom, which is Matt Taven, Mike Bennett, and Roderick Strong taking on the Beast Mortos and Shane Taylor Promotions, which is Shane Taylor and Lee Moriarty, and Ashley Andretti and Top Flight, which is Dante Martin and Darius Martin with Layla Gray. Uh, the Undisputed Kingdom uh, won here. Yeah, nothing really much to say about this match. It was your typical trios match. Nothing too special here. Now the show that opened the the match that opened up the main show was MJF taking on Daniel Garcia. This was actually a pretty good match Uh, the story between these two was uh, MJF was going to be in the the corner of Daniel Garcia but MJF turned on Garcia and going back to his uh, Healy scumbag thing before this this was before he won the international championship and uh, he ended up taking out uh, Danny Garcia by knocking him out with the Diamond Battle Casino Royal uh, ring. Uh, so, yeah, this was a pretty bloody match. Uh, Daniel Garcia got busted open pretty early into the match. And uh, MJF tro- did his... Did his... Did all his shtick... Uh, MJF would end up uh, winning here after a low blow and hitting his move and putting Garcia. But after the match, uh, MJF tried to hit another low blow, but Garcia saw it and he ended up grabbing MJF's uh, 
leg and end up hitting a low blow onto MJ Hills himself and end up laying him out. Apparently, MJF has been written off of TV. Well, so the, from what the rumors that I've heard, uh, MJF has got written off TV because he's about to film a movie. And the reason Daniel Garcia lost here is because he still hasn't signed a deal with AEW yet. That be I could be wrong with. Who actually knows what's going on backstage? Well, when. I know who knows who's got something on, but those who aren't supposed to know don't know. So, yeah, that's that's the whole reason between NJF and Daniel Garcia having... Well, that's the reason between NJF going over Daniel Garcia. Next match on the card was... The Young Bucks defending their championship against uh, Claudio Castagnoli and Willy Yuta of the Blackpool Combat Club. The Young Bucks end up retaining here. Uh, this was actually a pretty solid match. A typical Young Bucks match. Now, they did get in, get in a big swing uh, tag. The double team move that Claudio and Wheeler do. But there wasn't enough to for them to win the gold. Uh, BCC are the, well, especially Claude, well, this tag team of, like, of BCC, so Claudio and Wheeler, are the current AEW trios champions along with Pac. So I didn't, yeah, I, I don't think it was too wise an idea for them to be uh, winning the tag titles from the Bucks. Not sure sure which direction they'll be going with the Bucks. With the Bucks now. I mean I know what's happening with BCC. We'll, we'll get into that when we get to the world championship match. So but I'm not sure who the, the young Bucks will end up losing the championships to. It's a because they I feel the Young Bucks don't need to hold the championships anymore. I mean, they're at that point in AEW where they don't need the, ch- the championships. There's plenty of tag teams in AEW that could that that could hold the championships and elevate them. But yeah, it we'll just remains to be seen as to what goes on there. Uh, speaking of the World Trios champions, especially Puck, we've got him next taking on Will Ospreay for the International Championship. Uh, apparently, Ospreay and Puck have a long-standing history with each other. Uh, Will Ospreay had stated leading up to the match that he looked up to Puck, he, that, saying that Puck uh, laid the foundation for English wrestlers to go to Japan to, to go through all to go through all Europe and uh, wrestling through there and going to Japan before heading to the States. Uh, and Pack is the also the first person to hold the international championship when it was the All Atlantic Championship. And Pac won a fatal four-way match to get into this championship match. So, that, so he we defeated Claudio Castagnoli uh, and a couple other. It was Tomohiro Ishigi and someone else to get into the match. That was a pretty solid match. A uh, yeah, typical Will Ospreay Pac match. Uh, plenty of flippy shit. Uh, Will Ospreay end up retaining the championship. And uh, we had Ricochet uh, backstage watching the watching the match. Uh, Ospreay and Ricochet have a bit of a history dating back to their time, both their times in Japan before Ricochet headed to WWE. Uh, 
there's that that match, that that viral match between the two where they were doing a Power Rangers routine in Japan, which everybody has criticised for being too far too flippy and whatnot. So, uh, and also on Dynamite. Uh, so during, not during, during the show, they are uh, uh, Osprey and Ricochet end up having having some words where Ricochet said that he'd like to be the next one to challenge Osprey, and Osprey said to Ricochet, "Well, you better get some wins under your belt before you even think about challenging me." And rah rah rah. And you know, Ricochet said, "Yeah, I'll." I'll once I do get those wins, I'll be the one to take the championship off you. Next up, we have uh, the Chicago Street Fight between Chris Statlander and Willow Nightingale. Uh, this, rather, it, I can understand this rivalry confused me a little bit. Uh, they tried to explain the storyline by saying that Chris Statlander was the one that helped Willow Nightingale at every opportunity during her TBS championship run but Willow never helped her during her TBS championship run uh because Chris Statlander held the championship before Willow did, and Chris never got her rematch for the championship, and she thought that maybe Willow would give her the that that match. But Stokely's been really been the one that was getting in Statlander's ear about this whole thing. But yeah, but now this was a pretty. Brutal match. It was your typical street fight. It was your typical AEW street fight. There was trash cans and light tubes and all the fun stuff that you'd expect in a street fight in AEW. Uh, yeah, it went all over the the arena. At least the. It never went backstage, but it did get go all over the the main floor of the arena and up the rampway and whatnot. Uh, Chris Detlander would end up winning this match by submission, but I don't see this rivalry finishing anytime soon. So y'all can watch the next pay per view after all out. We got. Let me see here. Wrestle Dream. So yeah, I reckon that they'll have maybe the blow off at Wrestle Dream, maybe. But yeah, it's definitely not finishing at all out. Next up, we've got uh, Kazuchika Okada t- uh, defending his Continental Championship mat a uh, championship you know, in a Fatal Four Way match. Uh, with his defending it against Mark Briscoe, Orange Cassidy, and Konsuke Takeshita, with Don Callis at in at commentary. Now that was a big fuck Don Callis uh, chant going on at the start of the match, even though Don Callis was just sitting there at commentary. This man is the is a the a walking heat magnet. No one likes the cunt. Uh, Mark Briscoe and Orange Cassidy, they did their whole conglomeration thing. They did their whole antics. Especially with Orange Cassidy Cassidy doing the soft kicks that built up. Uh, Besides that, there was nothing special about the match. It was... I found it to be just... Yeah, 
This could have been just the main event of Dynamite or Collision, not a pay per view match, but I'll digress. Yeah, so yeah, Kazuchika Okada ended up retaining. Uh, so he's going to live to defend the championship for another day. And next up, we have Mercedes Monet defending her TBS championship against Hikari Shida, with Camille being banned from ringside. Now, Taz made a big deal about Camille not being at ringside, saying that uh, Mercedes and Camille make such a great team and Camille wouldn't impact the match. Although she would at least do what she could to help Mercedes retain. But, uh, and, uh, and, uh, Shivani ended up telling him that if Mercedes was really that great, then she doesn't need Camille to be there. But, uh, and Hikari Shida ended up running, winning a triple threat match to get into this match. And that was a solid match. You know, it wasn't too bad. Being in the AEW has really... Uh, exposed Mercedes Monet as a worker, so this wasn't. So this probably this was one of her better matches in AEW, uh, and she ended up winning this match despite Camille not being there. So, so yeah, she proved that she doesn't need Camille in, in her corner to help her win matches. Uh, so, yeah. I'd, this will be the and there was no, there was the one thing that got me was, was that there was no mention of uh, Dr. Britt Baker and ever since she uh, lost to Mercedes Monet at the last pay per view. There's been nothing on uh, uh, Mercedes on the rivalry between Mercedes or Dr. Britt Baker, but. So hopefully they can maybe continue their feud for a little bit longer. Next up is the... This is the main event of the sanctioned part of the of the show. So although it's not the last match of the show, it's the last match of the sanctioned portion of the show, as I uh, lightly mentioned after this match. And that is with Daniel Bryan defending his AEW World Championship against Jack Perry. The, the, the skate deck, Jack Perry. Uh, this was a very good match. I mean, Danielson is a very is a great worker. And Jack Perry is only getting better as he goes along. And yeah, I, I think facing Danielson has only helped Jack Perry get better. Now, Jack Perry uh, got this match because Danielson. Through open and open challenged, an open challenge for the championship for this show, and Jack Perry answered it, saying that he's getting better and better as he goes, and that he was the last person to pin Danielson at the Anarchy in the Arena match at Double or Nothing. Now this was probably one of uh, Danielson's better matches in the of the year. Uh, But and one of the, so especially one of the, uh, Perry's better matches. Uh, Perry rocked up to the arena in his uh, in his camper van bus thing, and the young bucks met him out there, and he, and they walked him to to the gorilla position, and he made his way to the ring. Uh, Daniel Bryan came out to the ring with his. Uh, Final Countdown theme song from the Indies. Well, yeah, Daniel Bryan's, uh, Brian Danielson ended up winning this match, uh, returning his championship. But it was uh, after the match where the commotion started. Uh, at All In, Christian won the Casino Gauntlet per win a a shot at the championship and uh, so Killswitch comes out to the ring attacks uh, Danielson 
and Christian comes down with the rest of the patriarchy. But BCC and PAC uh, end up getting in the way, stopping Christian from making it to the ring. And they end up uh, leaving uh, the, the, the patriarchy. And BCC and PAC end up getting into the ring and congratulating Danielson for the for winning this match. And then uh, Claudio ended up hitting Danielson with a European uppercut and everyone except for Willa Yuta end up uh, beating down Danielson. And there was a point where Mox got a plastic bag and put it over the head of Danielson going on to suffocate him with the bag. And you've got... Uh, Pack and uh, Claudio there just keep and watching. Will you just there crying, trying to get to Danielson to try and help him, but Claudio's holding Yuda back and you can see that Yuda's breaking down because his friends and beaten up is has been to they that Danielson's friends have turned their back on him. And uh then you got the commentary saying saying that you know, AEW's got the best medical team in the in the industry. So after the uh, they stopped that and they got BCC to to stop. So the the medical team go to Danielson and they rip the bag open. They they tear the bag open, but they keep it around his neck while they put oxygen on him. I mean, the, the oxygen in the canister, that's, that's what they're supposed to do, but they, they left the plastic bag on his head with a, a rent, with still part of it on his neck. And, yeah, that... I don't... I can, I can understand them beating him down, but the whole suffocating... Suffocating him, the Danielson was sort of a bit too far... Especially with what goes on in the main event, so yeah, they they end up taking Danielson to the back and getting him looked over and whatnot, and then Justin Roberts announces that that's the end of the sanctioned part of the night, and that the lights are about to go out, and when they turn on, AEW doesn't hold any responsibility for what for what for what is about to happen and then they announced it's time for the lights out unsanctioned uh, steel cage match between hangman page and swerve strickland now swerve comes uh, no, no, hangman comes out first he comes out through the uh, hill lock uh, entrance so before I'll get into that. Uh, Swerve and Hangman were both locked away in their own separate locker rooms with uh, security personnel around them to make sure that they stay in their own personal uh, locker rooms so that they don't end up uh, taking each other out before the match. So, yeah, look, when it was time for the match, they got taken out. So yeah, the hangman comes out first. He comes out through the uh, the uh, Ether Hill entrance, makes his way to the ring. Then Swerve comes out, and on his uh, jumper, he's got a picture of Hangman in front of the house that uh, Swerve burnt down. So on Don the on the go home dynamite. Uh, it was shown that Swerve bought his childhood home. And then, at the end of the night, when they were about to sign the contract for the match to make it official, Hangman had revealed that he was at the childhood home and he ended up burning it down. So, and he was doing the whole, well, you broke into my home and rah, 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 now I'm burning down your childhood home and so on and so forth. Uh, and, yeah, uh, Prince Nine ended up uh, throwing stuff into the into the ring like tables and whatnot. 
Uh, through through the match, I uh, Swerve brought in a cinder block that was used a few times. Uh, uh, Swerve was dropped onto it, and he ended up having a massive, massive scrape and it was back. Uh, Swerve was power bombed onto the cinder block, and the biggest criticism of this, well, those two spots that was highly criticised for this match and that was the unprotected chair shot to the head and chair shots to the head have been banned in WWE because of the concussion related issues that come along with it and more so because of the how Chris Benoit's Life ended. The, the, the last weekend of Chris Benoit's life. I'm not going to get into the, the, the details of that because that's a story for a completely new episode. And if you want me, I'll probably not get into the details on that at another day. Just not going to do it now. And there was also a hypodermic needle that was that uh, sw- so hangman did the unprotected chair shot to swerve's head and then swerve also got a hypodermic needle and stuck it into swerve's cheek uh which the with what we know about concussions chair shots to the head should shouldn't be allowed uh, and yeah, the whole needle thing that, yeah, that's a whole different thing. Uh, so that was the biggest criticisms of that match. Uh, but yeah, Hangman Adam Page ended up winning this match by knockout. And, yes, uh, in what well, has to be one of the more most violent matches in AEW history. Uh, I, this, this rivalry is not going to end anytime soon. Whether or not they have a match at the next pay per view, I don't know, but I don't see this rivalry ending anytime soon. And this has been one of the best stories in AEW so but yeah this won't be the last time we see them face each other so yeah now that's, that's uh, AEW all out for 2024 uh, make sure you tune in next week as we continue on with things uh yeah, make sure you like all, all the socials jpa podcast yeah follow youtube bulldozer williams and uh until then have a good one